right, so you said when I met you before you knew the Altair was coming, before the, before the uh, popular electronics hit the newsstand, but still, what, what did you think when you saw it in Harvard Square? Did it, did it sort of mark a new era in computing? The key event was the microprocessor itself, the availability of a chip that included all the elements of a computer. And we saw that in Electronics Magazine when I was still in 10th grade in high school. And we discussed what that meant. And that's when we got excited about the fact that this meant computers could be purchased by individuals and used in, in a different way. And we, we were surprised other people weren't um, expecting that and seeing that there was so much change. But it wasn't until three years later that the first uh, po product came out using a microprocessor, and that was when I was a student at Harvard University. And Paul Allen and I were walking through Harvard Square and saw the cover of a popular electronics magazine. And even though it was nice because what we had predicted was happening, our main reaction was that we better get going and get involved or else our whole vision was going to happen without us. So did you have any sense when you decided, okay, we're going to write software for this machine, did you have any sense how big this industry would get? Well, Paul and I wrote down when we started the company that we felt there'd be a personal computer on every desk and in every home. Uh, so we thought of it, even from the beginning, as a very pervasive tool, as an information tool. And we felt that more and more software would just uh, increase the number of tasks that the computer would help solve. And so that we were at the most exciting part of, of this revolution that, that would be taking place. So what was it like back then, different from now, <coughs> let's say, being a programmer? Were they sort of a different breed of people writing software for those machines? The early personal computers were not very powerful. So the idea of fitting your program into a small amount of memory it requires immense skill. Uh, our job was to put into a, a computer with only 4K of memory an entire basic, um, a full-blown floating point basic. And that's one of the greatest programming feats um, I've, I've ever had a chance to work on. Uh, we had so much fun just squeezing it down and uh, amazing people that, that such a thing could be done. The industry was very small in the, the 70s. People tended to know each other and I spent a lot of my time evangelizing, that is going to large companies and convincing them they should make computers like this. And then going around and helping user groups get started so that people who like this stuff could all get together and share their ideas and, and work together. So we had a a feeling as an industry that we were we knew something that other people didn't knew, know, and that it was very exciting and very important. The times proved you right. Well, the industry the industry has changed a lot now. Most of the people who I worked with in those earlier days are are no longer involved. Certainly, the things we felt about the pervasiveness of the tool and the importance of the tool all that is has proven to be true. What about who sort of has the power in the, in, in the industry now? I mean, you said back then you were going around evangelizing and asking, you know, different hardware makers, make this hardware for me, please. Do you think it's changed a little now? It, are people who are writing the software more in the driver's seat? Well, from the beginning, we felt that software was the key element that would determine how usable and how broadly applicable the machine was. So we focused on, on software fr from day one, and we were actually the first microcomputer software company. In terms of revenue, even today, uh, a higher percentage of the dollars are spent on hardware than software, although that's been shifting. Today, software is say, sometimes as much as a third of what people spend. That greatly understates, though, the importance of software when it comes to opening up new things or deciding even which hardware you ought to buy, the software is the most important element. And some software companies, including uh, our own, Microsoft, have ended up being very profitable as they've created high volume hit type products. 
And so the focus of attention is shifted very much to the software industry, not nearly as much as it will over the next 10 years. I mean, the, the center of, of exciting advances will be more and more on, on the software side. But why, why? I mean, why is it more and more on the software side? What's, 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 why is hardware being left behind? The analogies that try and explain the role of software and hardware aren't perfect, but the idea of uh, TV industry versus TV programming uh, is, is a good one, or the printing industry versus the book industry. And in those examples, you can see that the richness of what software provides by making the machine valuable to, to different people, uh, that's, that's what's new. It's what uh, people pay attention to. And once they see a piece of software that can help them in business or at home, then they ask, what hardware do they need to buy? And so the, the hardware is almost like a record player. The one difference, though, is that hardware is continuing to improve. So it's not, not static in that way. Uh, and so we have to have close cooperation between the hardware manufacturers and the software developers so that we take advantage of the new things that are done on the hardware side. So it'll, it'll never be as extreme as, say, a record player. But it's, it's the content, it's the experience, is all defined by the software piece. Enabled by hardware that can run it fast enough to, to, give you a, to, to allow you to, to create a user illusion. When you write a piece of software, you assume a certain type of hardware. And it's always a tough question. If you assume hardware that's too powerful, then you can't sell many copies because very few people have that machine. If you assume uh, hardware that's too simple, your product can't do as much. And so making that choice is one of the most important decisions that a software company makes. What hardware are uh, the software packages targeted for? We are interested in this comparison. How, how is the software industry different from another industry, like Boeing or something, where you're creating something Creating a piece of software is always complicated because you're doing something new. If, if you just wanted uh, something that had been done before, you just use that old piece of software. So there are no repetitive tasks. It means that it's very hard to estimate how hard it will be. It's extremely difficult to add new people to a project because you don't get any benefit from the new people if you're having to explain to them what's going on. and if their pieces don't fit in with the other pieces. And so often a very small teams are by far the most productive. You don't want to impose external measures on, on the team because they it's up to them how enthusiastic they are, or if one piece is easier, one piece harder, or they want to shift the design around. You have to give them total flexibility if you want to get the right results. And yet you want to measure what's going on. Uh, certainly you can you can judge if you put smart people onto the task, are they working hard, uh, but you still want to know when, when will they get done, should you cut back in terms of what you're asking them to do, and there is no science to it. It's ended up uh, that some companies pull the right pieces together and, and succeed, and a lot of companies don't. So what accounts for the success when the projects do go well? Most of the success of great software projects you can assign to picking great people to work on the project. People who are very smart in a scientific sense and who have a lot of energy and interest in what it is they're creating. And in any project review I can tell if people are uh, tuned into what's going on, if they've thought through the alternatives, if they're making the right choices, they've thought through what the problems are going to be uh, or not. You can get a feeling whether it's a, uh, even say, say within Microsoft a relatively great project team or a 
a team that needs to be livened up or given a less am ambitious task. What about the team I, I met with this morning for Peter's team? Are they unusual? They're getting a lot of jobs pretty much exactly on schedule. Is that a first? Don't mind me when this airs, the stuff? This airs next fall. Next fall, okay. Well, <laughs> their product will have been shipped long before that. Um, Our Excel team, headed by Chris Peters, is a fine example of a group uh, where everything's come together uh, in a uh, perfect way. The team is smart, they're excited. The specification that we wrote has a lot of very uh, new, innovative features, ones that we thought maybe we couldn't do, but there were breakthroughs along the way, and new ideas came along, and we were enough on top of things that we could add those into the schedule. And plus, th which these developers look at the competitive atmosphere, and they can see that uh, graphical interface that, that they're betting on is getting to be popular, and uh, Lotus is not getting its competitive product done very quickly. And so they sense the opportunity, and it, it builds uh, even more excitement in that group that, that they uh, should get their thing done. The fact that we were able to pick the completion date several years in advance. Uh, it's partly because we're, we put enough buffers in for surprises, but it's also a, a real milestone in the way that we manage these projects. That's, that's quite unusual even for us to know when something will, will get done in advance. So, I mean, what did you do? Did you engineer it differently or you just lucked out with a good team? No, it's... Because it was complicated. <clears throat> the writing software you know, that's our, our life. I mean, this every day we think about could we use a different tool, could we organize things differently, and there's a variety of things that we're doing in our projects now that are making them more predictable. Uh, one of those is that we have phases where we get a certain set of pieces done and uh, test them before we move on to the, the next. The idea that you think you've got something done, but uh, when you go to test it, certain problems of speed or interactions come up, can often make you have to go back to work that you haven't looked at for quite some time. And so using this phased approach as, as one of the uh, smart things we did with the Excel project. Now they're, um, I guess, in the last week of um, debugging and they're getting ready to, to finish it up. And they're having people sort of play games and not not play actually with the software, I guess, because they felt there's sort of a risk with code to, with, with a project, because it's just code, you can add a new feature, right? There's no physical constraint that's keeping you from, from not adding a new feature. It's not like the cement won't dry in time. Is this, I mean, is this a risk that, that you have to avoid or did you be careful not to have people play with the software product toward the end of the project? When you develop software, the people who write the software, the developers are, are the key group, but the testers also play a, an absolutely critical role. They're the ones who uh, write thousands and thousands of examples and make sure that it's go going to work on all the different computers and printers and the different amounts of memory or networks that the software will be used in. That's a a very hard job. As you get to the end of the project, you want to run all the test cases against one version and make sure that you know that version passed everything. And so as you get late in the project, you get a little more conservative about making radical changes to the software. And finally in the last month where we are now, you make sure that every change is examined by lots of the programmers so that you don't get what we call a regression going backwards in terms of the reliability. This means that the, at the very end, the testers are on the critical path. It's their testing that's hard because they're not finding enough bugs to keep the developers uh, busy all the time. And, and the developers are already thinking about the next version that they're going to get done wanting to incorporate their new ideas in the current product, right? I mean, 
more so the fiction to write to write a new feature well they understand I mean yeah. is this everybody's part of the same process yeah is this something that that has been the result of some experience that you've had you know say here at Microsoft where maybe in the early days it wasn't as clear that that when you make changes at the last minute they're going to have unforeseen repercussions or that you sort of have to discipline people not to not to tinker with it toward the end no I mean yeah. everybody always follows, follows the rules uh, there's no every project towards the end you do less stuff I mean that's always been the case the need for testing has gone up as the size of the products go up and as the the number of machines you're going to run them on so the scale the scale of things changes but the basic principle I mean he, he is the same even when I wrote basic myself the day before I burned it into a computer I wasn't making design changes I didn't have a testing team. I did all all the testing myself, and there was no project methodology or schedule. But uh, there was the the notion of coming to a close means testing a lot at the, at the end and making very few changes. Okay. Um, still, sort of interested in this difference between physical and, and digital media. What about debugging? I mean, if you're if you're building something and you, you've got a leaky roof, you know exactly where to look. Because is going to be located physically near where it's manifested. What about in software? How is that different? Software is, is different than other products, uh, partly because it's it's not physical, and and partly because of its its complexity. You can express in software uh, millions of different cases, and making sure that you handle all of them correctly is extremely difficult there are more inputs than you could possibly have time to step through and knowing which test cases are, are worth going through and, and when you're ready to ship the thing is it's not a, a science it's there's more of an art to that certain teams are more careful in what they write they generate less bugs you you can know that but it still doesn't mean there might be might not be one bug that uh, would be bad to ship the product with and so there's a whole body of knowledge being developed about how you do testing and uh, some optimism that maybe the computer itself will be able to help in the testing process uh, but uh, not not much going on practically with that right now the other great thing about about software though is that um, you can you can pick exactly when you want to come out with new versions. Uh, so you decide how amb ambitious you want to be. If you want to ship a new version in two years, you're coming up with a specification that matches that, that time schedule based on your experience of how long does it take to write it and test it, how good of a team do you have involved with the thing. Um, and it's certainly exciting to have a product where you can update all of your users at very low cost. They don't have to go and buy a new car or anything. They can just substitute in the new disks or even just download it into their network and boom, they have the new version. And so the old users get the benefits of your new ideas. That means that literally within a few weeks of shipping a new product, you can have, say, a million people who are enjoying using it, uh, getting onto bulletin boards and saying what they like, saying what they don't like, sending in reports, building on top of it, maybe enjoying their job more because of it. And we, we get all that feedback, and then we use that to decide how to do the next version. So it's possible to get closer to your users uh, with this kind of product than, than with most other products. And uh, if you decide you want to to get a new version out, you know, three or four months later, uh, you could do that too. What about debugging as, as programs get increasingly long and more complex? Is there, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, for projects like space shuttle programs or something that are really, really long, is, is it possible to ever really debug a program, to fully debug a program? There's a famous debate about whether 
programs of a certain complexity can be debugged. This came up in the Strategic Defense Initiative where some people were saying that maybe the program that would control all the sensors looking at incoming missiles and then control the uh, reaction of the uh, missiles going up, that even if the hardware was great, that the, the software part, you might not be able to trust it. In the software industry, people might, like myself are optimistic that uh, by using the right tools and breaking things down into pieces, that that problem could be solved. Uh, but it, it sort of suggests the state of the art that uh, very smart people in the software field disagreed about whether that could be done or not. So there's certainly some scale at which our current tools are inadequate. Um, the trick generally is to break params into pieces and have those pieces be individually testable and so then when you move on to the other pieces you treat it as a black box knowing that it either works or doesn't work. The same ideas apply in any type of engineering area. It's just that the interface, the boundary between one piece of the program and another, keeping that simple, so you can think of it as a black box, is very, very hard. It's part of doing uh, very intelligent design, is breaking things down in, in the right way. So it's a matter of trying to make it less like this sort of virtual, infinitely flexible media, right? You want to try to emulate physical things so that you can wrap your mind around it and think about how they'll interact together and trying to avoid too much complexity to handle, is that it? I mean, for, for a one mind to handle. Well, I don't know about the, 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 the physical analogy. People, it's, people are building the software and so having the pieces be such that a single person understands all the trade-offs and everything that's going on in a piece is extremely valuable. It avoids you getting into an experimental mode where you're just trying things out. And that never works. In any of our projects, even though we may have as many as uh, 20 or 25 people involved, uh, for the major pieces, we have one person we really trust who understands the speed and, and what it would take to do changes and who can look over all the changes made to that piece. And so the idea of dividing it down so that uh, people understand it, it r really has to do with you know, what can you keep in your mind, what can you uh, have a, a total understanding of. So it's, it's almost a human limitation. Are you talking about There are a variety of techniques for breaking software down into pieces and making software development more efficient. Many of these techniques have been sort of, uh, and everybody got excited about, but very little benefit was actually derived once the, the thing was put into practice. Software is inherently complicated. If you say to somebody, I want an airline reservation system, to really say what you want in terms of uh, overbooking and fares and uh, different airlines communicating with each other or schedule changes. It's immensely complex and so you, you can't write a program that's any simpler than that full specification. In software what we're trying to do is make it so that just by describing that specification then that's the program. You don't have to do any uh, special things besides state the problem in a very, very exact form. And there are uh, advances that are pushing us in that direction fairly slowly. Another trick in software is to avoid rewriting the software by using a piece that's already been written, so-called component approach, which the latest term for this, the most advanced form, is, is what's called object-oriented programming. And the strongest analogy is to think of writing a book. You don't go to other books and take little pieces because although say a, a romantic scene may have been written many times before, 
all the details of who it is, where it is, uh, are so intertwined in that text that it's easier to write it from scratch. And that's the way programming has been to date, even though something like searching a table has been written millions of times. When we have a new program that involves searching a table, there are reasons why we don't grab that old code. Very, very similar to this idea of trying to take something from someone else's book. And uh, the type of breakthrough we're looking for is where you separate out those details from the basic idea, and so the basic pieces can be used again and again. And, and this, this is object-oriented programming. You said something earlier that I want to pick up on. You said that programmers are out there coding. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to um, and Chris said that too. And I wonder, you know, why is it that, that programmers share that trait? What is it about the, the medium you're working with that makes programmers optimists? Okay, so why, why are programmers optimists? Or are they? I think if you talk to the experts in any field where you have to take on a unknown challenge, where you're going to be working on it for a long time, you'd find that uh, to work themselves up to their best performance and really throw them, themselves into it, you know, spend all these hours in there and, and uh, uh, give, it, give it their best, that optimism plays a role. I mean, if, if you had a group that was about to climb Everest and you said, do you guys think you'll make it to the top? And they said, well, we have to be realistic. You know, there's a good chance we'll, we'll die. You might not um, expect them to uh, be the, the most energetic at pursuing the thing. So I think it's partly uh, when you're world class and there is this level of uncertainty, uh, you don't want to worry about it. You want to plunge ahead and have the probability of seeing breakthrough ideas uh, that you hadn't anticipated, have yourself be as open-minded to that as possible, not just counting on the fact that you won't see a, a shortcut along the way. But is there something also about the idea that you could, in theory, do anything in code, right? You're not limited by you know, the, the tensile strength of the metal or what have you. Is, is that part of it? When, when you program, you want to think you're writing the best possible program for the, the task you're trying to solve. And even for the very best programmers, uh, sometimes you'll see someone else's program or somebody will come along and they'll show you it can be done in a simpler way. And it kind of blows your mind to recognize Gosh, the possibilities of clever programming are so incredible. Uh, there are, are often uh, neat ways to do things. And good programmers stay open-minded to that, even though there's no obvious way to improve what they've done. They, they, they keep looking and they listen to what other people have to say. That's why we have this concept of a lot of people looking at the code, reviewing the code to see if they have a better approach to it. And uh, open-mindedness is, is very important. Uh, we, we can't mathematically ever prove uh, that we've gotten the best program. Um, so how do you motivate your software developers to get a project done? How do you make them optimistic about it, or are they just born that way? The mo most important thing is to pick people who like to write software and who are good. Uh, good developers like working with each other, and they, they reinforce each other's skills. Uh, good developers like seeing their products sell in large quantities. They enjoy the competition of doing a better job than the other company, especially if the other company has more people on the project and they're entrenched and people are saying that we don't have a chance of getting in there. And, and doing well. So you have to view it as a mission uh, and build up a, a very high level of excitement. Make sure they know all the pieces of what, what you're doing and you know, assign them a, a very uh, tough part of the job. For us that's meant 
uh, groups of about 15 people who early in the project go off, really talk through what's going to happen, and uh, spend intense period of time working together. Uh, we try to set that to be around two years because anything more than that, uh, you know, it's hard to see the end and if you have to course correct, it's, it's a bit of a problem. But we need about that much time to do something that's so significant that users actually want to change what, what they have. So it sounds like your most valuable resource is the smart people who work together well. Is that a concern for you that you might, you know, someday not have enough people to write software? I mean, Microsoft's growing pretty quickly. How do you, how do you get people into the company? Just like If you look at a light, it usually. Trying to see yeah, I was, but it's not bright enough. <laughs> anyway, um, from the day Microsoft was started, the only constraint to our growth has been attracting uh, more great programmers, very smart, committed uh, people, and so we're always on on the look for uh, that kind of person. And over the years, you know, we've gotten to know the various college campuses. We've gone outside the United States and pushed the immigration department absolutely to its limits in terms of letting us bring in uh, smart people from other countries. It's uh, con of considerable interest to us, you know, where can we find uh, more of these world-class developers? And it's been the key to our success that we've found uh, far more than our fair share. If you were going to try to convince someone who you thought would be a good programmer, say, let's say someone who'd never seen a computer, which is kind of hard, hard to believe, but what would you tell them about writing software to make them want to, want to do that? What is it about it that's so interesting? If you're smart, you often want a feedback loop so that you know if what you've done is, is right and uh, you, know, you can adjust. In the pure sciences, of course, there is a concrete test of whether theories work or not, but uh, the frontiers are very far out there. The, the practical impact of those things is fairly limited. Um, and so we can often attract people who were in a pure science, at least uh, in school, uh, to an area that requires the same precise thinking and yet uh, has this impact that you can meet people who are using the software and they can tell you what's good or what's bad. And you can work with other very smart people and you know, show them, you know, do you have the, the right stuff to uh, do incredible software? It's, it's often somebody who's been involved in the sciences and likes the idea of a concrete test of uh, excellence rather than just you know, a very um, soft definition of, of what's right. Okay. Um, oh, I just wanted to ask you in sort of a different way about the people on a project, number of people on a project. Again, if you're building an airplane and you're running behind schedule, you put more people on the project. What would happen to you if, if you did that on a software product that was running behind schedule? In software, you can't really add people and expect to get more done because their ability to understand the program and what's going on will require so much investment and all their work would require so much review that you'd be more likely to slow things down. Uh, in, in programming, when you're making a change, you have to know all the affected places and you have to be able to model in your head what the performance impact will be. And so we, when we start out with a team of a certain size, we can only increase it a small amount during the course of a project. Okay. Um, so I read your, um, your speech that you gave at Convex. I guess the, the buzzword at Microsoft is information at your fingertips. What do you mean by that? The 
term information at your fingertips is to remind people what a broad role the personal computer will be playing. It's not a computation device, it's not a word processing or a spreadsheet device. It's a window onto the world of information. Anything that someone's interested in should be very, very easy to call up onto the screen. And in fact, the computer over time will see what you're interested in and make that immediately available without your having to give any commands at all. This includes not just text and numbers, also pictures and sound, um, information from outside a company like the news data or other people's prices, or data of an educational nature, learning about the human body or movies or sports, should all be right there. And so that, that phrase is a challenge to the people in the industry uh, to come up with the software and data and networks um, that will make this a, a valuable tool for literally for everyone. That's a, that's a hardware problem too though, right? I mean people have to have access, there have to be lines between the information. How do you see that getting organized? In other lines? Words, I mean, you've oh, got... Connections. Yeah. In order to fulfill this idea of information at your fingertips, we have to have not only a, a lot better software, but also uh, portable computers that you can write on, uh, big flat screens so that the wall of an office could display data and you could just point to it and, and see more detail. Uh, we need motion video and sound, which current computers have very limited capabilities in those areas. The machines need to get faster, they need to get cheaper. One reason that we don't dwell on this, though, is that uh, those advances are predictable. They will absolutely come, uh, just because chips get more powerful and uh, the key technologies like storage and screen display. There's so much great work going on. Uh, the most open area is uh, how available will the information be? That is, how easy will it be for people to reach out and find what they're interested in? And that's a software question, and that's an interface question. Yeah, finding, finding information is either a software question or a question of how much information is online. For example, in teaching students about all of history, you've got to make sure that you found somebody who understands it very well, who put in the pictures and text and uh, was financially motivated or somehow motivated to, to make all that data available. Um, we're looking at artificial reality as, as sort of the next, as a step from the 2D to the 3D interface. And in a way, it, it seems like it's at the stage, and the hardware right now is still not quite there for it, and it's still incredibly expensive to put on one of these demos. Would you say, is it analogous to where someone like Engelbart was back in the 1960s where he was trying to demonstrate the power of a, of a 2D interface with a mouse? Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, what term are you using? Virtual reality or artificial reality? Virtual reality. Okay. <clears throat> Vir virtual reality is at, at a very early stage. The demonstrations people do are uh, very simple uh, scenes and uh, the equipment's kind of unwieldy and a little expensive. However, it, it will develop fairly quickly. I don't think it'll take the same oh, 20 to 25 year period that uh, using graphics on a computer screen took. Because we have the foundation, we have all these personal computers and software companies and uh, companies that build inexpensive chips that will attack this problem. So it, it might be 10 years or maybe even 15 years, but uh, a lot of the things that you see in very specialized applications now, like flight simulation, will become broadly available. Even if the hardware is expensive, you can imagine an arcade that you go into and get to use 
uh, the equipment on a on a temporary basis. The toughest problems are also uh, uh, software problems. The idea of making it realistic that you're walking around on the desert. So right now we're it's so new to us the idea of walking around a 3D scene and just hitting a, a ball or something that very simple representations of what's going on are, are fascinating. They kind of grab us. But to make it an enduring phenomenon where you'd really find it fun, you'll have to have a lot of uh, physical things happening. And the software, to make those things happen quickly and appear realistic, it's quite complex, although they're, they're very smart people working on it. Is that a field that you see Microsoft getting into? Microsoft's role in, in this uh, will be fairly limited. Uh, we sell a flight simulator game, and as it becomes pervasive, we may do some, some entertainment titles. But the, uh, most of the interest comes from people thinking of uh, walking through architectural models or traveling on the moon or, or flight simulation. And so our focus on improving access to information and work in the office uh, doesn't directly overlap virtual reality. What's the most important thing that you think has happened in personal computing since you joined the industry? Well, there, <laughs> there was no personal computer industry before. Uh, we do, I mean, I, it didn't happen. I mean, there, what, there wasn't, uh, wasn't an industry. The, the most important thing was the creation of a, a standard where hundreds of companies build hardware that can all run the same software. The effect that's had on allowing software companies to write even obscure applications and be able to sell them in high volume and therefore make money is really incredible. Uh, it's a level of openness that allows people to switch their hardware without any change in the software whatsoever. And now we have over 60 million machines that can take the same diskette, plug it in, and immediately uh, that, that software is working. And so it's created uh, the worldwide software industry that, that is so very competitive and, and moving uh, so quickly. Do you have any last thoughts for me on how software engineering Now, soft, software is definitely engineering. It's different in that we take on novel tasks every time. It's not like building a certain bridge that is virtually identical to some previous bridge or some previous building. And the number of times those people make mistakes is very small. And you know, first you think, well, what's wrong with us? Why do we miss our dates? And sometimes it's too slow. Uh, it's because it's like we're building the first um, skyscraper every time, or the first, you know, Verrazano uh, Bridge every time. And so we're having to invent the whole approaches of how pieces work together and see uh, limitations that you wouldn't you wouldn't have expected because nobody has worked there before. So in the sense of, of doing very novel things, uh, it's a tough area of engineering, uh, almost like the engineers work on space missions or creating all new things. Now, they, they have certain approaches uh, that you know, they do duplicate systems and they test the systems, and a lot of that got uh, pioneered in the, the early uh, space shots. Software will get to be somewhat more mature. Uh, but it'll never be as predictable as, as most areas of, of engineering.